go. Okay, for the purposes of this, you should have this worksheet out. Um, I'm going to pull problems from it, and uh, this is going to take about two days to do between these two, this, this thing. We're not going to get through them all, and I try to do a decent job of separating out the homework into problems that you can do from the first half, and then problems that you can do from the second half. But I would consider the next two days of assignments to really be one thing. Mrs. Manton is doing something in her pre-calc one class where she is teaching straight through uh, and having like collective days of homework questions, but she's not checking homework regularly, just kind of more collectively at the end, um, and says you like you really need it's all due by quiz day. I'm, I'm not quite there. I think you guys need a little bit of structured like this should be done with this and this should be done with this. But I see the point of that, and this would be a day where the next two days I can I can very much see that. Uh, I know one of you <coughs> at least um, would kind of question if I don't get through everything, then which problems would go which which things. I'm going to trust you guys can kind of handle that and sort of get a thematic idea of what's going on with this, um, and I'll just hopefully you know get through these questions over the next two days. So um, these I don't consider this to be as difficult as related rates. In some ways, the problems in your book should actually be problems that you've seen before. I know that because they are the exact same problems that were in your pre-calc book. Um, this is just an easier way to do them. Once you can find derivatives, you can find maxes and mins very quickly rather than trying to find the vertex of a parabola or other means that you had to do that. Um, but optimization is much more than just parabolas. So what these are about is um, finding a function that could potentially have a largest or smallest value. Um, how would you determine where that largest or smallest value is? Yeah, you take a first derivative. Um, you're looking for these to be located at turning points. So they could be local mins and local maxes, but usually they're global mins and global maxes, which if they're global on an open interval, that means they have to have an absolute min or max. That, the terms I just used there should actually make sense to you. So if it's an open interval, meaning we have arrows on both sides, that would not have an absolute min or absolute max. So typically our polynomials, if we're going to do polynomials, are going to be ones that have even degree. Because even degree ones are going to squiggle and then open up, or squiggle and then go down, both of them. Odd degrees are the ones that are going to be a little, little weird. But in any case, um, turning points are where the first derivative is equal to zero. <coughs> okay. So looking at number one, Sorry, I'm trying to plug this in because this drains battery really quickly when I do this. Uh, hmm? No, it's okay. Okay, looking at number one. Number one asks, which points on the graph of y equals 4 minus x squared um, are closest to the point 0, 2? And I'm doing this because I wanted you to kind of see what I'm sketching down. Um, you're going to have a s worksheets at times similar to this, and obviously you're going to have book stuff, so you'll want to see, like, what do you need to just copy down? Uh, you do not need to copy down the original problem in its entirety. Just get the pertinent information down. So closest to 0, 2. So you're going to create a function. It's not a function that's present here, but you're going to create a function. And if you really are not seeing what it is you need to do, um, turn on a grid. Let's make them smaller grid lines. Someone always says that, Leo. Uh, but just sketch a graph of what it looks like. So y equals 4 minus x squared is up 4. It's just a standard, like, negative 1. So there, there, and then 2, 4. Put some here. You don't need to be that specific about it. And then closest to 0, 2. So 0, 2 is right here. And I'm trying to create... Okay, so if I drew a perpendicular distance to that graph, Right away, you can see we're going to have two solutions, and they should be symmetrical to each other. Uh, what you can do is you can call this point x, y, but you don't need to do x, y. We want it in terms of a single variable. So we've done this trick before where I call it x, comma, what? Four f of x, which is 4 minus x squared. <coughs> and then this ordered pair is 0, 2. And I'm going to define a function distance in terms of x between the two points is equal to 
the big square root of the change in x squared plus the change in y squared. And I want to take a first derivative of that and set it equal to 0. Now, I will tell you a trick. This function reaches its smallest possible value when the thing underneath the radical reaches its smallest possible value. Right? So instead of taking the first derivative of this function, I'm going to define a second function that I'm going to call r of x, and that's just for radicand. Radicand is the name for the thing underneath the radical. r of x is equal to x squared plus 2 minus x squared squared. I didn't drop the radical. I, I'm actually just creating a new function and kind of logically reasoning through that where the first distance is minimized, that would be at the place where the thing underneath the radical is the smallest. So I can, I can just take the derivative of the thing underneath the radical, find what x value that is smallest, and then realize that that would be the same x value that the one right above it would also have the smallest possible value. Basically, when I find the x value that brings these two points closest, it's the same x value that brings the thing under the radical as small as possible. So I can just do the radical part. You can do the derivative with the original one. It's just going to take you a little bit more time. And we're trying to minimize time on these things. So what I'm going to do with this, okay, first derivative, so we're going to do r prime of x equals 2x plus, uh, I need to do a chain rule of this. So negative 2x times 2 minus x squared to the first power. And I'm missing something. I'm missing the 2. So I'm going to take this and slide it to the right just so I can have the 2 kind of in there. Chain rule is enough that I always kind of go back and double and then triple check it. It's passed the double check. It did not pass the triple check. I realized, wait, that 2 needed to be there. Um, so I get 2x. Uh, this is going to be minus 4x. So let's just multiply it in. Minus 8x um, plus... 4x squared cubed okay and then that's going to be if I set this equal to 0 and factor well let me add it up together I don't want to skip too many steps so we got that um, let's take out a 2x you get an x squared minus 3, or 2x squared minus 3, equals 0. <coughs> you get x equals 0, and x is equal to plus or minus root 3 halves, which for us is okay. Now, that is step 1. You found the critical values of the first derivative. Um, those are possible mins or maxes. What you now want to do is either do a sign test or do a second, sorry, let me rephrase, do a first derivative test for mins and maxes or a second derivative test for mins and maxes. I'm going to write that down here. So now do either a first derivative test for min max or a second derivative test. for min max. You had a second derivative test for concavity. This is not what we really care about. We care about just determining whether it's a min or max. Um, to evaluate which one of the two of those you can do, you can decide, you can look at your first derivative and say, is it easier to take a first derivative of this and it just kind of start plugging values in? Or is it easier just to take the first derivative and do a sign test? I think it's about 50-50 here. Um, I'm going to do a first derivative test just to be a little different and do different ones on different problems. So for that, I'm just going to do a sign, or sorry, uh, number line, which I want to make pretty. And we're going to put 0 and positive root 3 halves here and negative root 3 halves here. And I know that that's, I'm actually plugging them back into the first derivative. So remember on that very first quiz, some of you guys were plugging them back into the um, original function. I'm plugging it into the first derivative and trying to see what's the sign of the first derivative. So here's the first derivative in sort of pseudo-factored form. 
If you wanted to put that completely in factored form, you'd write it as 2x, um, x minus root 3 halves, and x plus root 3 halves. This is just to get an idea of how many factors you're dealing with. But really, I think it's obvious that when you plug in a super large x value, um, it's going to become positive, and it's going to alternate around all of those because there's no factor that's being repeated. So plus, minus, plus, minus. Remember, it will not do that if you have a repeated factor, meaning a factor squared. Uh, factor cubes, it will alternate, but factors to the even powers, it won't alternate around. So I'm looking for places where the graph goes from decreasing to increasing. You see those places? Because I want minimums. That's a minimum. That's a minimum. On an AP exam, if you're trying to show whether a number is a minimum, you have to write out a very wordy statement of since f prime of x is less than 0 when x is less than negative root 3 halves, and I'm only going to do this for one of them, and f prime of x is greater than 0 when x is greater than negative root 3 halves, um, f has a minimum at x equals negative root 3 halves. You'd have to write that for every single like one that you're trying to show. And the time's going to, I need to be more picky about that with you guys than I was this last year. Because the time's going to come where you need to say that a sine graph on an AP question is not enough to show that something's a min or max. Like you need to have an explanation that's your interpretation of what you did. Um, so that would just be proving one of them. The other spot is the positive root 3 halves. So one of the things you can say is, um, like make this a plus or minus. I know that this is not really great notation here because it's not true everywhere. It's you know less than or greater than. It's just only parts of that. But whatever. Um, for our purposes, this is good enough. So that shows that the uh, minimum occurs at plus or minus root three halves, comma. Uh, what would the other order pair be? Four minus x squared, four minus three halves, five halves. Okay, that was our first one. Every one of these is going to be like this somehow, but it's two steps. You find where you think it happens, and then you prove whether it's a max or min. It's that second step that people are going to miss. Don't don't forget that one. Yeah, for you. Um, wouldn't zero be a maximum? Zero would be a local maximum. It's if if you look at how the function's working, and think about this as being like a graph that like this function is basically describing the distances between those. So as we move kind of further towards that, it's, you reach a local minimum right here, and then you start to increase again. So that's a local maximum, but it's not a global maximum. There is no global maximum because you can be as infinite distance away. Okay, number two um, talks about two positive numbers that the second number is reciprocal of the first and the sum is a minimum. So I'm going to let x equal the first number which means that 1 over x is the reciprocal. And I'm going to define a function, s of x, to be equal to the sum of the two. The lag on this is really extreme. x plus 1 over x. Provided you are focused on this and not completely distracted by March Madness, uh, the sum, I would express this as, like, I would take the derivative as you see it right now. S prime of x is equal to 1. This would be minus 1 over x squared. And now I would add those together to figure out where it's equal to 0. Um, x squared minus 1 over x squared. And that would be equal to 0 at two pretty obvious values, plus or minus 1. Okay. Now, with this one, I'm going to prove this using a second derivative test to show that this can be just as easy. So it requires me to find s double prime. And s double prime here is just this derivative of s prime. Here's s prime. The derivative of 1 is 0. 
um, this would be 2 over x cubed. And if you need to prove that, just write it as negative x to the negative 2 and do power rule on that. So 2x to the ne uh, 2 over x cubed, <coughs> I can then say s double prime of 1 is equal to 2, which is greater than 0. And s double prime of negative 1 is equal to negative 2, which is less than 0. In fact, you don't even need to say what it's equal to. You can just say greater than 0 or less than 0. Your statement on an AP exam here would be basically since s double prime of 1 is equal to 2, which is greater than 0, and s prime of 1 is equal to 0, both conditions have to be true, then x equals 1 is a, do we say that's a min or a max? Min. It's a min. What is the question asking for? At the minimum. So I don't need to deal with this part right here because that's not um, that's not less than or that's not greater than zero. That that value is less than zero. It'd be a local max. Um, it wants it so that the sum is a minimum. Um, so we can say minimum occurs with, and we just say what the two numbers are. Um, a number is reciprocal, so 1 and 1, because 1 is its own reciprocal. Hmm. Um, we're going to skip to number 4, and we'll probably only have enough time to set it up if we do on that one. Uh, design an open docks having a square base and a surface area of 104 square inches, so uh, open top, open box. I try to draw. Yeah. Um, and if it says it has a surface area, surface area of 108 square, okay, so square base. So we got x, x, and h is the height. Um, I know that volume is equal to x squared h, and surface area is equal to a single x squared plus, wouldn't that be four xh's? And it says that that surface area is equal to 108. So if I'm trying to maximize the volume equation, um, what would be a logical thing to do here? I have an equation with surface area and I have an equation with volume. What's the best thing I can do with this? Yeah. Not yet. Combine it. Because I've got two var variables in the volume. I want a single variable. So let's make this h is equal to 108 minus x squared over negative 4x, which for the purposes of combining it should be, I'm sorry, that's over 4x, not over negative 4x. Thank you. Um, if I take this and plug it in here, we have a le actually less than that. I get volume in terms of x is equal to x squared times 108 minus x squared over 4x. And just to show that that's going to be even easier of a function than you think it is, um, if I multiply that in, my x's are going to cancel, and I just get 108 fourths x, which you can simplify that down, minus uh, one fourth x cubed, and that's not terrible to take a derivative of. And I'll leave it there. That's more set up than I thought I would get it. Okay, I'm going to put the homework up. Okay. Um, my recommendation try to get through as much, if not all, of this as you can. Um, you're going to be stronger for it. You don't have class on Monday, um, so please, please get ahead. Otherwise, next week's going to be pretty intense. Uh, but get this done and see me for help if you need it, and you'll be good. Okay, pause video, actually end video.